Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning, God, that your people, your children can come together, Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, do something in here today. Come here, Heavenly Father. Dwell among the praises of your people. Lord, shine forth your glory here, Heavenly Father, that we would just be drawn to you, Heavenly Father, to know you more. Lord God, we pray, Lord, as we open up your word, your precious word, Heavenly Father, that you alone, God, would be exalted here. You alone would be lifted up. Heavenly Father, we just pray. We pray and ask, Lord God, for your hand here this morning. Let me get out of the way, Heavenly Father, that you can speak. Take a sinner like me, Heavenly Father, and let me submit to you, Heavenly Father, and may your word be planted deep in everyone here today. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, Lord, and we praise you, God, and in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Isn't it good to be house of the Lord? It's good to be in the house of the Lord together, and we want to praise him. We want to acknowledge him here as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one who has dominion in this house is Jesus Christ. And we love to worship him in adoration. You know, one thing I, I just to share with you, you know, out of the flesh a little bit, last week when we were coming and, and you know, last couple weeks, last week was different, this week was different, we have nobody up here on the platform. And, and I got to say, and, and I want to be honest and I want to be transparent that, you know, some of the things that were going through my mind were like, oh, what is everybody going to think? Is everybody going to leave the church? I sound just like the world. And, and you know something, when I got done with my pity party and my whining and, and all those kind of things, the Lord taught me something here last week. It's only about one person. If you need lights, if you need a guitar, if you need microphones, if I need these things, then I'm not seeking the one I come to worship. You know, in the Old Testament, they didn't have such things. In Africa, the churches that are planted under big oak trees, they don't have any of these things. China, who, who hides, they don't have these things, but yet they worship the Lord. So that's just a lesson I learned. I don't know about you last week, but I learned a lot about myself, and it brought me to a place, to be honest with you, of repentance, because I was not being right with God. And I just share that with you. And we're so glad to be together, though, and I'm so glad to be able to extend in chapter 6 of Acts. Jim, our brother Jim, did an outstanding job with a text in Acts chapter 6 last week in those first six verses, and I'm going to continue and even put my toe in a little bit in those verses again today. And if you are watching from home and you're not with us and you're on Facebook Live, we thank you so much for allowing us into your homes. And I pray today that uh, today would be a blessing on to you as well um, in the text. So we're in a series called sent. You know, we see how the apostles were sent to uh, Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth with the gospel. And so we titled our series Sent, and we were thinking about how we've been learning and studying how God, he, he birthed the church, this early church, this beautiful church. And, and we just see how he shaped it and he formed it and he, this display of great miracles and events like the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the church, equipping the church for the ministry that it was going to be undertaking. You know, I was thinking this morning about how even you and I, if we reflected back in our lives, we could be thinking about some events, maybe some things God has done that drew you closer to God. The evidence of who God was was greater in those times and these events, and sometimes it's good to remember those events. I'm going to share one later with you about me. But... In the text today, I was thinking about a time when the first time I got a chance to hear John Piper in person, I was uh, told to go to a, I was basically told to go to a conference I didn't want to go. And uh, John Piper was the final speaker of the conference. And God had me there for a reason to listen to this man. He blew me away. He brought about the cross of Calvary and the blood of Christ in such a powerful way that he alone would, he alone captivated through the power of the Holy Spirit, his word, God's word. And he brought about a biblical truth 
that everybody was confronted with this Christ. And it was so powerful. You know, when I was there also, I had an opportunity to go, uh, because I, know, I don't know if everybody knows, but I play guitar. And um, I, I went to the Gibson guitar plant. I come from an area of manufacturing in my life, so I, I like the way things are built and have an interest in that. But I had a chance to take a tour of the facility. And, and while we're going through this tour, I always remember something. And God brought this thing to my mind later on. Um, as you, before you get into the plant, there's this long hallway. And this long hallway, the, the guy who was giving the tour kind of brought you to this place of history. What were the humble beginnings of Gibson? And, and these, these big pictures were along the walls, and he would have you look to the left, have you look to the right. Literally, the trees in the forest that they would take were special wood for the Gibson guitar. And you know how uh, the humble beginnings of how they're milled in, and the craftsmen that would put their hands upon these guitars. So much is different today as a, a plant, you know, manufacture these things. And, but there was a time when it was just humble beginnings. It was humble beginnings, and these craftsmen would take their hands and put them upon. The finish would be perfect. There would be no abrasions to these guitars. The bodies, the wood that would be chosen for these, because the, they wanted a particular sound that come out of these bodies. There was a craftsmanship beyond compare. When you get done with it, they actually had a vintage guitar shop where I saw this Les Paul guitar that was like a vintage one that was like unbelievable. And it was made by these craftsmen. Why do I share all these things? As we've been studying in Acts, in this early church, sometimes it's very easy, and I think and I hope and I pray, that through this study of Acts, that God would take every one of you back through a hall of history, maybe. And, and in, through this hall of history, you would see the humble beginnings of this church. And what the church really needed, and was really needed God, a return back to God, and a power of the Holy Spirit. And, and you see in Acts how it said, you know, we, we read in the early chapters of Acts, they, they were saying, what is it with these Galileans? You think about this, who God chose. Galileans, fishermen. They were called in the scriptures in Acts, what? Uneducated. And in fact, they were. See, Jewish boys, they would all go to be taught under the rabbi. And as they were taught under the rabbi, they had to go through these different stages. Like we have grades, they would go through these different stages. And once the rabbi didn't think you cut it, he would bring you to the parents and just say, he's done. All these fishermen, they were done. You go back and you learn the trade of your parents. Fishermen, what did they know? They knew how to fish, men nets clean fish. What did they know? Yet a rabbi walked into their life, and his name was Jesus Christ. The rabbi says, come, follow me. The very rejection they, they felt from man, Jesus Christ himself raised them up. That's who these Galileans were. And you think of the text and how important that was, that God was going to make them an instrument. He could see beyond the rough bark of who they were, that rough exterior of being these fishermen, to see what really lies in the heart of man and how the Holy Spirit could change that heart of man, these uneducated men. He alone would, like a fine craftsman, would sand off the roughness of these men, humble these men. He would smooth out all the abrasions that life and the world had just placed upon them. He would cut into them by the power of the Holy Spirit, notch into them, drill into them, so they would, their message would sound perfect, just like that Gibson guitar. The message would be perfect, inside and out, a work crafted by the Master and by the work of the Holy Spirit. They would be an instrument of the Master's hand, and that's what we have seen throughout Acts. So they would fill all Jerusalem, like they said, a sound of the gospel, like the mighty horn of salvation. Have you ever thought of yourself as an instrument of the master? You know, we admire this church, and when we read this, and so many people, we just admire this church, say, boy, I would love to be part of this church. But have you ever felt, have you ever thought of yourself as an instrument in God's hand? So when he called you, when the Holy Spirit came to you, that you alone 
would feel like the master was going to take you by the hand. He alone would take out those abrasions. He alone would put a sound in you, a message in you with a gospel that would not be able to stop. The gospel's unstoppable. We've seen this without it throughout Acts. And we'll continue to see this, and we see it even today. But have you ever thought of yourself this way? See, we can admire things and we can fantasize about things. But you've been called just like these Galileans. And sometimes we think we're less than instead of knowing who the God, who he called. He knew exactly who he was calling. And we've seen in the early church as well is that persecution was going to come, but we saw the instrument played louder. We saw sin was going to be exposed. In Acts chapter 5, yet God held the instrument tighter, adjusting it, tuning the instrument, that the purity of the sound was going to be a perfect pitch of the gospel. We saw that uh, dissension in chapter 6. We've seen that uh, what Jim brought for us last week, that there was problems in the church, and this could have cracked the body. This could have changed the church. Could have ruined its sound, his message. But the craftsmen and the apostles cared for the instrument, protecting it, so the main purpose of the instrument would be ready, kept, and prepared. Last week in chapter 6, we were introduced to seven men instruments of the Lord to serve and they were recognized out of thousands of men this is incredible and today in the balance of the chapter of six the it it takes away it moves from the seven and really focuses on one person and his name is Stephen which I'd like to share with you today so if you'd open up your Bibles with me to Acts chapter six um, we're going to look at verses eight through fifteen and I will digress into the first uh, seven chapters, well, a little, verses a little bit too. But uh, open up your Bibles with me and I'll read to you. You can follow along with me. We'll also have the verses up on the screen. Starting in verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, of those of Cicil- Cicilicia, and Asia rose up out of the, and ra- disputed with Stephen, I'm sorry. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who would say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak the words against the holy place and the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. This is God's word. Let it have take root in us this morning. It's interesting here as we... Uh, finish up chapter 6 because at least at the beginning of Acts we've seen that the Apostle Peter was going to be the main voice of the Apostles and he was going to be the one to preach sermon after sermon and he was the one that was confronting the religious elite along with the um, other Apostles but God demonstrates his miracles epic opportunity to preach the gospel and use Peter They literally said that they were turning Jerusalem upside down. Imagine that. And as in the previous chapters, Luke documents for us great and marvelous works of the Holy Spirit inspired by God and also the scriptures. What I love the way Luke writes is that it isn't just that. He allows us, he he opens up another door for us to get really to peek into what was going on in the bigger narrative of the church. We get a chance to look underneath these things. The very church that captivates us, that draws us, that we want to be just like. Luke desires to show us that even beyond all the greatness and what God was doing, resistance was never too far behind. And again, we see it in chapter 6. In verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, "In, In those days when the disciples were growing in number, this is a great problem. The gospel was unstoppable. The gospel was going forward. This was the greatest season of evangelism. It was an explosion. I called it a tsunami a couple weeks ago. This was temple taking, 
disciple making. This was power. This was powerful, the, the message that they had. It was an invasion of the most divine kind. Is this the gospel you see preached today? Is this the gospel you share today? You've been dwelt with a Holy Spirit, a power from God, a power from heaven. He's given you a message, a voice, a sound. Is this what you hear today? Or do we hear voices that we just want to be like the world so no one will bother us? See, all behind these testimonial proclamations, a complaint came up about the Hellenists arose, the Hebrews, because their widows were, not be, they were being neglected in the daily distribution. Conflict in the church. Imagine this now, this pure church, this church that had so much power and was doing all this evangelism and, and God himself was moving about Jerusalem like never before. It was amazing what was happening here. And yet something happened within the church that could have divided the church such a way that when we use adjectives for the church, we learn that they were devoted people to one another. They were devoted to the word, one another. They were devoted to the breaking of bread and to prayer. There was a devotion. There was something in the heart for these people. We learn that they were one. There was a oneness in the church. It says one heart, one soul. There was something about this church that you couldn't separate. We, we learn that this was a miraculous church, that they followed the work of God, and God was just doing miracle after miracle after miracle in this church. And here, the very thing that could have knocked away the oneness, the devotion to one another, is potentially dissension in the group because they were being neglected. The most important issue is there's one Lord. There is one body. There is one baptism. Scripture teaches us that there's a oneness within the body that should never be severed. And everything, we should do everything in our power as God's children to make things right with one another. That there's a oneness that's unbreakable because the gospel is unstoppable. They chose seven men, and these seven men were of uh, Greek name. They could have very well been Hellenists, and they were to take care of this. It says that the whole congregation, after what the apostles said, that they would put their time to the word of God in prayer, choosing seven, it said that the whole congregation was joyous of this. There was oneness, and they were satisfied. And this really brings us to our text this morning. See, there's a transition of sort. And I'm excited about this transition. I hope you are. Because something's going to happen within these next month for us. We've seen the great baptism of the church. We saw the church being born. But something else is in the works that Luke wants to prepare for us this morning. You know... Uh, between Peter, Peter was once that powerful voice for the apostles to the circumcised. But we're going to see over chapter after chapter that this starts fading away. And as, as Peter starts fading away as the, the main spokesperson, this main apostle, there's someone that the Lord wants to show us on the horizon. There's someone standing there waiting for us. And we're going to see this in other chapters. Who is this person? It's the Apostle Paul. He waits for us. He's standing on the horizon for us. And between Peter and the Apostle Paul, we learn about this man, Stephen. And young people, I want you to hear me about something here. When you think about your life, when you think about Stephen and you read about Stephen, I want to encourage you or something. It has nothing to do with your age has nothing to do with the amount of time that you've been a Christian. Stephen was a baby Christian. And he was going to be a mighty bridge to what God wanted to do. And I'd encourage every one of you to walk in faith. Pursue God with all your heart. Forget about your age. Move. Have your being in him. Your message has already been given to you. Go shout it to the world. And the world will listen. They listen to Stephen. Stephen was an amazing young man. And that's where I got the title of the message today. Because out of the text today, there's clearly two things. 
We're going to learn more about the person of Stephen. And then we're also going to know about this opposition that he faced. Both things. And it came out to the title of the message. I called it Living Full. Living Full. Meaning live as an instrument of the Lord. Even in the midst of persecution or opposition. And then when we look at the life of Stephen throughout the whole chapter of 6, we learn five indications of this man's living full. This short man's life. This young man's life. One is full of the Holy Spirit. Two, full of wisdom. Three, full of faith. Four, full of grace. Five, full of power. Acts 6, 3 says, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of spirit and wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. And, and some people might say, what does that even mean? We can constantly use words in church that mean nothing. We say, oh, okay. But really, what we do is we take these words, we take things we're learning, and we go and file them in a library, and it has no effect on his life. But this church was filled with the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean? Well, the word even in verse 8 is polaris, the Greek word, which means to be filled up in the same way you could be filled with joy. You could be filled with hope. There's this filling. Because we know, right, the believer is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. You have this Holy Spirit. So you can be continually filled with the Holy Spirit as you draw near to him. And this is a controversial subject. Some people think that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit is two different things. So there's classes of Christians. You ever hear someone say, oh, I go to a spirit-filled church? What does that even mean? If you're a believer, isn't the Spirit here? Isn't the Spirit here because you indwelt with the Holy Spirit? But even Christian churches try to divide and make classes. There is no class. Either you are or you're not. See, it means fully yielding. This continual feeling is yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You've been indwelled with the Spirit, but as you yield more and more to God, God does something in you. He fills you. Walking in the Spirit. Ephesians tell us what? Walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. We walk in the Spirit, living in full control in every aspect of our life by the Spirit. I love David the psalmist. What does he write in one? He said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the, w uh, the wicked, nor does he stand in the, in the way of sinners, nor does he sit in the seat of scoffers. No. He is a man who delights and meditates on the word of God. And on that word, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water. He's rooted in a God it's by streams of water. It says that he yields its fruit in, in, in season, that his leaves never wither, and all that he does is prosper. There's something about a man of God who follows and yields himself to God, being rooted and built up in him like that mighty tree. When you yield yourself every single day to the work of the Spirit in your life, can I tell you, there's a radiance about your life. There was a radiance about this young man Stephen's life. Out of thousands and thousands of men, this young man, they saw this in him. His life shined before them. This is in the same way we see Jesus radiating his Father in Hebrews 1, 3a. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says us, and, and we all with unveiled faces that we believe, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from who is the Spirit. The work of the Spirit is clear. And we see this in Acts. In Acts 6, 15, at the very end of the verses that I read to you this morning, it says, when all of them seeing me and gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Stephen lived full. He lived in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, yielding himself every single day. He was chosen to wait tables, serve people. This is this young man. 
This was the work of the Spirit in him. And he was also chosen early on out of the, from the congregation because he was full of wisdom. Stephen was recognized by his biblical knowledge and his practical wisdom, meaning that he could apply biblical truth to the situations every day. Do you know people who know they can recite to you all these Bibles, but they can't live a lick, lick of them? This young man, what he knew, he knew how to live. And this is a powerful testimony. This is a tool. This is an instrument of God when someone can take the, the words of the Bible and know how to live them and apply them to your everyday life. Hear me, young people, again. God can use you. God can use you. God can use you. Wherever he takes you, he can use you. Yield yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Learn, draw near to God through the scriptures that you would know him. Amen. <laughs> See, he was a baby Christian, yet he demonstrated a life and an affection for the word of God. This is a powerful tool in the hands of God. He didn't only have head knowledge of the scriptures, but he had a heart knowledge to apply him to his life and to the life of others. This is what people need. This is what the world needs right now. Do you know that? In the midst of all this chaos we're going through, they need to hear from the Lord. How are they going to hear if someone doesn't speak? As we learn of in Acts, as Stephen faced opposition, he could because of the Spirit that dwelt in him. Acts 6.10 says this, but they couldn't even withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. P Stephen could stand his ground with anybody. You know, we found uh, Peter and the apostles in this council many times. And here again, a young man like Stephen, an instrument of the Lord, he could hold himself, he could stand the ground because he knew the word of God, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And in that, he had confidence and faith. He displayed great grace. But no one could deny the power that was coming through this young man. See, is that the way of the believer today? Is really that the way of the believer today? Could we lose our way when we think that we have to manufacture something ourselves? We come from traditions, maybe, that it was works-based, that, you know, I'm, I'm nothing, so I have to do all these things. You have to yield yourself to the work of God in you and the Holy Spirit. That's what you have to do. God is going to do the rest. The reality of grace is made known. Then faith and belief, the wisdom and the power. Stephen was recognized for wisdom and knowledge that he possessed by the Holy Spirit. This gave him a great confidence in his God that he could stand life or death. He could stand before anyone with confidence and assurance and explain this gospel. He didn't shy away from the opposition, but rather, like the apostles, he entered in trusting God and taking the opportunity for the gospel. His life was, char he was characteristic by being yielded to the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. And it also says he was full of faith. In Acts 6, 5a, it says they chose... Uh, they chose uh, Stephen, a man of full of faith in the Holy Spirit. You see how it's tied together. Being full of the Holy Spirit, he believed. This is a repetitive nature in Luke's writing. So there's something emphatic here. When you read all these things he was full of, see how the Holy Spirit's attached to each one of them. Luke wants us to know something. You can't get away from the Holy Spirit. There's going to be a work of God in you to believe, and it would be him that it would fill you and it would be him that would purpose you. He had deep belief. So what did he believe? As a young Christian, imagine sometimes we don't want to get in the discussions because I don't know enough. I hear this all the time. I don't want to evangelize because I don't think I know enough, so I don't really want to say anything. But what did he believe? And we're going to learn much more of that next week in chapter 7. But can I highlight some things for you? Because Stephen has a lot to offer us. He believed in the creator God, the same God who appeared to the father Abraham, the same God who cast the stars in the sky, formed and shaped the earth. Stephen believed in this God. 
Stephen goes on to tell the history in chapter 7 of a nation and a people of God. Stephen believed that God was the one who was writing all history. We're convinced sometimes in our mind it's politicians that are writing history, that it's philosophers that write history. No, God has written all history, and it's in his power that we stand. It's in his power we move, and it's in his power we speak. It's powerful. He believed in the sovereignty of God, do you? If there's anything that the church needs to repent about, it's the sovereignty of God, really who God is to us. There's much more that we can use, learn from this young Christian named Stephen. We can be so distracted by the world around us, the chaos, the sorrows, that kind of wings our faith sometimes. We don't know, but he is a sovereign God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Stephen also believed deeply in Jesus Christ the Messiah. Acts 7, 55. But he, meaning Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, it says, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He was filled with the Holy Spirit even to the point before he was going to die. Where is the church? Where do we look in these times? Do we look to heaven? Or do we look just what's around us, earth? I think, sadly, many Christians today could be dis not described as living full, full of faith. As we usually whine and we ask, why, why, why? Why God this? Why me? Why, why, why? And I can honestly say I've done that, some of that in my life. But when we yield to God in the purpose that he gives us trials, when we yield to him, he, man he, he just... Mag manifest himself powerfully. I was thinking about in scripture where that young man, uh, the father brings his son, and his son is a, sometimes it cast him into the fire and sometimes cast him into the water almost like he would kill himself. And his father at wit's end and he, and he sees Jesus. And, um, and it says in verse 22, it says and as he often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him, but if you can do anything the father says. He's at the end of his rope. Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father cried out and said, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. To be full of faith is to trust God. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to obey fully his will. Stephen believed. He believed God and submitted to the leading and the empowering and the purifying of the Holy Spirit. He was full of faith, an unwavering faith that he would even take to the end. The realities of faith and spirit were hot behind, you know, I like hymns. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. It's faith. Truly trust. You know, we've speak the words. But when you find that rubble, when it hits the road, it's through times of difficulty and times of trials. Do you trust him? Do you trust a sovereign God that is above all things, through all things, that he will carry you through that trial and it will be his end and his purpose that he would be glorified? Do you trust? Do you obey? There's no other way. Acts chapter 6 says, tells us Stephen was also full of grace. Stephen realized that this grace at his salvation, a favor that was given to him that he didn't deserve. Stephen's heart was truly shaped by Calvary, humility, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. He realized that Jesus Christ being the just died for the unjust, someone just like him. He, he believed in all his heart that the righteousness of God was given to him, even though he didn't deserve it. This was a grace upon grace that flowed to him. Stephen, they never fear, or he was in hatred, that, but he was controlled by the yielding of the Holy Spirit. He trusted and he submitted to Christ alone. He could be gracious to even those who persecuted him, even to the point of death. Acts 7, 60, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Doesn't Stephen sound like our Lord? Do you know who he was shaped by? 
Jesus Christ himself. Full of grace shows the continuing dying to self that the grace of God would abound in him. If we're distracted and consumed with this world, we might miss, we might have little inclination of the work of the Spirit in our lives and the grace that flew from Calvary for you. I can't emphasize this enough. You were the unjust. You were the unrighteous. That Jesus Christ literally went to the cross and as a great high priest carried the lamb and was placed upon an altar, a cross, that his blood would be shed for the forgiveness of sin, for all that would believe in him that you'd have everlasting life, an eternal kingdom, everything. He said, scripture says that he, he lavished upon us everything from heaven through Christ. He was full of grace. And finally, as a result of filling of the Holy Spirit, faith and grace, God released in this young man a great full, a fullness of power. 6 B says, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. This was an outflow of the Holy Spirit. And you see what happened here. The apostles laid hands on them, on Stephen, on the seven men. They were affirmed publicly and that they would be an extension of the apostolic ministry. They were given this power, just like the apostles Stephen was given. And that flowed through him. And this way God was going to be used to catapult the gospel beyond Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. From Stephen's life, mass persecution was going to happen. And the church was going to be scattered. And the, and the people, except for the apostles, they would remain in Jerusalem, but the gospel was going to go forward. It was going to be through this young man's short Christian life that was powered by the Holy Spirit that God would use this young man for a great glory. The gospel was just going to expand exponentially. This is a powerful thing. You may not want that in your life, to, that to happen. But can I tell you, you can't hide God's power. So that was Stephen, full of Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, full of faith, full of grace and full of power. Who was this opposition? Acts 6, 9, it goes on to the rest to kind of explain who these guys were. There's some that belonged to a synagogue called Freedmen. And in 63 BC, there was an emperor named Pompey. He took Jewish people into slavery. And these men, these freed men, was literally what they were called. They were released. And it was probably at this time... Um, and it, I'm not sure if this is totally accurate, but it, but it could have very well been about 400 synagogues at the time. And it's written in the Talmud um, that, that these freed men came and they, they stayed in a synagogue together. The Cyrenes and the Alexandrians, all of them. And, and so what we have here is when we see they were Jews, right? The Cyrenes and the Alexandrians, they were Jews from two major cities in North Africa. Both cities had large Jewish populations. Sicilia and Asia were Roman provinces in Asia Minor. And I'm going to connect a dot for you here this morning. Because this is very important for us to know. This is what Luke does. He allows us to see something else. He wants to pique your interest in something here. Because in Sicilia, was, uh, Tarsus was the name of the town. Do you know who lived in Tarsus? which was a then named called Saul. He was there for the stoning of Stephen. He could have been there when Stephen, next chapter, we're going to see it, Stephen gives his rebuttal. The apostle Paul could have been very much right there to hear the testimony of the gospel. He could have been right there. And although he was going to send out mass persecution, God had another plan. I hope that connected some dots for you. See, and they could not de debate Stephen, verse 10, so they couldn't stand to his wisdom. Do you know that debating in the Hebrew culture was an art? They debated all the time. We don't know how to do it in this country. <laughs> right? But this was part of their culture. This was part of their culture, that they would debate. And they couldn't even debate him because of his wisdom 
and the power in which he spoke. But they, they charged him with blasphemy, words against Moses and God. And let me just tell you, they were serious, serious charges that they were blaming him with here. They put him in front of the council. Remember I told you it was the hewn of stone. It was a, a place off the side of the temple where it was all hewn out of stone and it was like a semicircle and they would place whoever they were uh, speaking against, they'd place them in the middle and everybody would be sitting around them and they would be, he would be questioned. This is what this young man was going through. You know, when they told Joshua, be bold and be strong, young people, let me tell you something, be bold and be strong. Because chapter 7, you're going to see what Stephen does. He, he, he does a great job. But these words, what does blasphemy mean? We use all these church words, and, but what does it mean? Blasphemy is simply this, speaking evil of something that God deems sacred. The impartable sin. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy against God himself. That's what they were charging him with. And you see this, where did it come from? Leviticus 24, verse 16. The law of Moses, the person of God, his temple. He was getting charged with everything. And Stephen was being set up before the council. It tells us that they secretly instigated men who said that they heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. Does this give you a picture of someone else that went before the council of Jesus Christ? And they set up false witnesses who said this man never ceases to speak words against the holy place and the law. This is what Jesus spoke in John 2, 19. When the Jews confronted Jesus, he told them, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. They didn't understand Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus was speaking about the crucifixion, the resurrection of Christ, the gospel, and he never ceased to talk about it. Praise the Lord. May you never cease to talk about it. In verse 14, it says, They have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. The apostles, remember what they were told in their council meetings. Strictly, do not speak in the name of Jesus Christ. Yet Stephen was speaking in the name of Jesus Christ. What was he speaking? The risen Christ would fulfill all the old and bring in the new. The covenant of his blood. The temple sacrifice would no longer be needed. Here's the customs. They, they were all upset with this. Christ's high priestly sacrifice was going to be sufficient for all time. High priests were going to be out of business. You were affecting their economy, by the way. Customs to which the external religion was going to be satisfied by Christ and heart transformation. Circumcision of the flesh would be transferred to circumcision of the heart through Christ. All faith would be built around a chief cornerstone in Christ. And we know that's what marked the church. So how is it that we can live full? If we really desire to be this church, you are the church. How, how can we live full? Do you know that when we don't yield ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're really denying God in our own lives? When you question God, says, well, God, I know I don't know enough. I know I don't this. I'm inadequate in this. And you give God a litany of things that you're not, but yet he called you. You're denying him. He, know why, he knew why he called you. How can we live full how could we experience all the power God intends for the church? Well, we must be full of the Holy Spirit. We need to yield totally to the control of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our life. Have you done that? You know, the, the old saying is, the, uh, the last thing any Christian yields over to God is his wallet. It's a true statement. I know it was me. We should be called to be full of wisdom. We should have that desire to be a learner. We should have an affection for it. It'd be like a thirst that his word would dwell richly in us. Full of faith to believe and have confidence in all assurance in a sovereign God that we too could be instruments of the master's hand. 
for kingdom purposes, full of grace, full of power that would come from heaven. You know, I, I uh, brought this up with me today because um, I want to share something with you. And in my life, I, I know I'm not perfect by any means, for sure, but in my early days as a Christian, I, I fell in love with Jesus Christ. Many people praying for me. My wife had become a Christian before me and her praying for me. But I went through a very awkward season when very early on in my faith, I loved Jesus. I did. But I, I walked very much in the world as well. You ever try as a Christian to walk with both one foot in with the Lord and one foot in the world? But I got to tell you, I, I don't know why, but I couldn't yield myself the way that Stephen did. And, and it brought about for me, I felt it was walls between me and God. I didn't understand this at the time. And, and it got to a point of such frustration, I'm like saying, God, why did you even save me? I knew I didn't deserve it, but why? And this went on for a long time. It affected my sleep. It was like this churning inside of me. Like I didn't understand it. I never thought I was demon-possessed. But until one day, me lamenting once again at my table. And on my table, the Lord met me. Now, he didn't audibly speak to me, but he spoke to my heart. And on my table was... Uh, something like this, it was a dishcloth. And if you went to my ordination, you've already heard this, so I apologize for repeating. But he said, Jim, that's who you are. Now, I know what you're thinking. You have self-esteem problems, Jim. <laughs> no, he said, Jim, you're, you're a rag. This has set my life. That the Lord showed me my purpose. And, and he showed my purpose because all I thought about was John 13, and I'm like going back to John 13, and I want to know more about John 13. And I remember the Lord saying to the apostles and disciples, do you know what I did for you? And this was just melting inside of me. That he said, it's not about you, Jim, but someday I'm going to take it, I'm going to grab a hold of you, and you're going to be an instrument of mine. This is my calling on my life, by the way, and it still is. He took me, and he brought me to junior high kids that needed the Lord, and the Lord picked up his rack that he would go over these children. The Lord brought me to a church in East Town that I really didn't know anybody. And again, he picked up a rag, and he brought me out to the streets of Taunton where people that... No one cared about homeless people and drug addiction people and all these kind of people. And he grabbed me and he said, Jim, yeah, I want to use you. When I held them, when they were dying in my arms, when these people that had felt they had no value, they had nothing, were coming, that we literally could plant a church there for them, that they would come. We would be baptizing people in the parking lot. People would be coming to faith, and I'm like, there was only God working in their lives, but every once in a while, God would just pick up this rag and he would use it. God's used me in so many times when man and woman, husband and wife, were coming to me and, and to my wife and just saying, it's over, we're done. And God would say, Jim, no, he would grab the rag and he would say, I'm going to use you. Can I tell you something? Maybe none of you want to be the rag, but to me it's an honor to be this rag. Amen. And you know, he's brought me to Mansfield. He's asked me to be a rag here, to be in your life, to do what he wants me to do, to bring a people. It's clear, part of this rag, he's told me, Jim, return people back to the word of God, not the show of church. Bring them back to the word of God. He said, out of ashes, he'll raise his glory. Out of this church that was ready to close months before we were coming here, 
that he had another work. And I don't know what all that means, but I will tell you this. I wasted a lot of time instead of yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit. But God is graceful. My thing to you, church, would be this. He may not call on you to be a rag, but he's calling you. And my, my intention for everyone here is to clearly hear this. If you walk away with anything from this morning, from the scriptures, is live full. Live full, church, and see what God will do in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you. Heavenly Father, that above all things and through all things is you, God. That before us, Heavenly Father, is this gospel, this powerful message from heaven that you sent your only begotten Son. That on the cross of Calvary, a blood that would be shed would be all sufficient for all time, past, present, and future, Heavenly Father. That all who gaze, all who long, all who come, Heavenly Father, and call upon the name of the Lord will be saved will have eternal life, Heavenly Father. So we pray right now, Heavenly Father, even those that might be watching from home, Heavenly Father, we pray. We pray for this gospel message that when you're confronted with Jesus, what are you going to do? He died, the just for the unjust, things that we could never accomplish on our own. This is a work of God empowered by the Holy Spirit that you could believe and have faith Heavenly Father, we pray and we ask, Lord God, there's some that in their unbelief, like that man, we pray today there could be belief. Lord, we're asking and praying for some that may not know you, that they would come and you would be there, Lord, and by the power of the Holy Spirit and change their heart from sinner to saved. So, Lord God, we pray and we ask for everyone here, Heavenly Father, that it might have felt like they're in a time of a, a desert. They might, have find, they might feel that they're inadequate in so many ways, but yet, Heavenly Father, you called them by name. Heavenly Father, it was your choice, not ours. That yet, while we were still sinners, Heavenly Father, you loved us first. Heavenly Father, we could live out this call. I pray that today, maybe there's someone even here that needs to be awoke to this God that need just a shrug on their shoulder to say, wake up, for I am here, and I am God. Lord, I pray for this work, and may your church be alive once again. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, and we praise you, Heavenly Father, in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can stand with me. We're going to sing in, in Christ alone.